So we're moving into the final straight. Your reward of a glass of sparkling wine, probably not very expensive, or a glass of warm orange juice awaits you. Um, so um, we'll move on to our second um, keynote of the day, which um, Linda Drew's going to give us. Linda is Deputy Director of, De Deputy Director of Glasgow School of Art, um, and her th thesis was on the experience of teaching in art design and communication, and she's, I think, I'm right in saying, one of the many students on the programme who's used phenomenography to inform her research. So we had to have someone who'd done phenomenography, has so many theses um, used that. So um, after um, Linda did the programme, obviously she's, she's now at Glasgow, and before that she was head of college of Chelsea College of Art. So um, it's a great pleasure to introduce Linda and for to ask her to give her keynote. Thanks, Thank Linda. Thank um, I, I couldn't really do this without referring to some of the things that have become some of my big friends throughout my life. So uh, this is, as much as anything, it's, um, it may be some familiar ideas to some of you. Uh, I hope they are. There might be some new ideas to some of you, depending on where you are in the programme. Um, and... Uh, when I was putting this together, I was trying to think which were the kind of really pervasive things, which were the things I've taken with me, and which of the, the concepts uh, and approaches that I actually use still in what I do, and, and how have I uh, adapted some of those things to my current situation. Um, and in fact, I started off with the halfway up the staircase idea, because it was actually, um, I use this in my interview for my current post. And although they may not be familiar with the implementation of staircase, Murray Saunders, <laughs> um, it, it, was, it was something that was a very, it's a very compelling um, metaphor, that staircase idea. And I used this slide, not with that title, but I used this slide in the presentation that I gave to, uh, to senior management and staff at the Glasgow School of Art. Uh, and I was able to say to them that the, I'm the kind of person that's halfway up the staircase. Um, and I also gave them the other cultural references, depending on your age, which is either Christopher Robin, um, halfway up the staircase, or Kermit the Frog, depending on how old you are, because he did a version of that. Um, I won't hum the tune. Um, and, so, and this is a particular staircase. This is one of the staircases at the Glasgow School of Art. I hope I won't ruin this, this, this arrangement here, um, which you can't currently get into at the moment because there was a tragic fire in May of this year, uh, busy putting things right. But so, so therefore, the sort of staircase imagery was something at least everybody felt familiar with um, and understood that really um, the, the way I see myself, the role that I play in relation to uh, policy is a role of interpreter, interlocutor, as somebody that's not necessarily on the receiving end, but somebody that acts in an interpretive way and isn't necessarily policy writing, but is policy mediating, so to speak. Um, there's been a number of things, though, apart from uh, working out that I'm somewhere halfway up that staircase, that have actually affected... Uh, and change my identity as, not just as I've gone through the PhD process, but also since then as well, a number of things which have been sort of crucial identity moments. So I've also subtitled this reflecting um, on practice identity and impact. Um, and I think identity is a, a really massive thing for a lot of us. One of the things that I really made sure about today, which I thought would be really, really important because I'm really sad that there's nobody else here from my cohort, because one of the things that they used to have a real go at me about was when you come to Lancaster, it's really not the place for wearing slingbacks. So I thought, <laughs> I am going to wear a pair of slingbacks today because they, they, really, they really told me that you need to wear like really practical clothes. Uh, in the north. So practical clothes have gone out the window. Um, and also because they're part of my disciplinary identity. Um, so, sorry about that, folks, but that's a really in key important part of my practice and the way that, 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 that people recognise me. Um, and I do wear sensible shoes, but I've just decided not to wear them today. Um, and this is me 
being a professor. That's a, a key, another key identity change, and it's something I still kind of have to pinch myself about sometimes. Um, I got a full professorship in 2007 uh, and hadn't actually realised quite how exacting a process it is about fitting university criteria and so on. I have moved institution since then, and I've had to go through uh, a similar procedure with the University of Glasgow, so I can say I'm a professor at the University of Glasgow. Um, and the, uh, with the hand gestures there, I'm actually explaining, this is a, a photograph from another conference, explaining what I mean about relational, because you have to do that with your hands. So what are these pervasive ideas on the... And it was interesting hearing Ray this morning talking about the student experience because my concept of the student experience is possibly slightly different because I think of the student experience as being, um, as in the title of my own PhD thesis, something which is wider than the consumer experience. It's, it's about the number of different ways that students perceive and engage with um, the activity. And also about practice. So... I'm just going to have a little scamper through some of those pervasive ideas. They won't be all of the pervasive ideas in my career or in yours, but they'll be just, as I say, a little sort of scamper through in my kitten heels. Oh. So practice. I start off with this picture because it's um, uh, certainly some of, the, some of the things that I came, the, the little bits of uh, troublesome knowledge that I, I wanted to, to look at when I came to do this PhD were around how people learnt to practice particular things. One of the things I really, really loved about the PhD was that practice was a key element of the programme. Um, and notions of practice, different um, theories, different um, uh, ways of looking at practice. Um, and this is a picture of somebody learning in, in, a, in a fashion. In the art and design world, we would call this sitting by Nelly. And this probably on the left is Nelly. Um, and it's really interesting, this is an apprentice on the right-hand side. You can see she's probably got her hands tied to her back, not being allowed to, to interfere with the woman that's obviously the expert in the situation. And I wanted to know about things like, what, was, what were the conditions for expert knowledge? What were the conditions about learning how to develop expertise or to develop uh, things where it was very difficult to explain what the, uh, what the knowledge was in a particular situation? So the context for the, for the work was also looking at the context of um, that kind of rather messy place, the art school, um, looking at things in that student experience space um, and looking at various thematics within that variation on not just learning into practice, but also the different stages of the, of the learner journey, for instance, things about not just the entry to the community of practice, but also how that develops as somebody moves through uh, the practice space. Um, and so my other areas of interest were about not just the learner experience, but the teacher experience of the same kinds of things. Teacher variation in teacher experience of learning to be a teacher, learning to teach, approaches to leadership, and also approaches to curriculum. I hope you can see that um, I think in your handouts, the, the little yellow words go a bit blobby for you, probably. So don't panic about that. <laughs> they are bon mot, but they, they, you won't lose sleep over it. Um, and so the content, so that was context. The content... Um, I've, I've chosen here some particular images from archives from across, across the place about learning and teaching in art and design. Um, some of them are Glasgow School of Art. These actual images are London College of Fashion, actually, from, from their archive. So, yeah, people do t still teach drawing. Learning and teaching in the studio or the community of practice dimension. A, a lot of my approaches were around looking at... Um, the relationship between the, the, the phenomenography of experience and experience in terms of uh, conceptions of teaching, conceptions of learning, but relating to that to the community of practice dimension. Um, 
And so some of my research content has changed since that moment, since the moment of the PhD, and it's moved into explorations around co-creation, which I'll come back to later, which is a bit more situated. So methodologies and approaches. And obviously, I have to say something about phenomenography, but I'm not going to go into <coughs> too much detail because you've probably heard all that before. Um, and phenomenography was something... Um, I was a bit frightened to say it before I even got to Lancaster. And then when I mentioned it to my supervisor, first of all, he said, oh, God, um, you know, you don't, you, you really want to do that. And my supervisor at the time was, um, was Peter Knight. And uh, he said, why didn't you think, why, why didn't you want to do actor network theory or something? I kept on trying to persuade me to do something else. Um, but actually what I was really looking for was something that really illuminated um, variation. Um, so we looked at it in different places. So I'm going to give you a very, very quick summary of what the, uh, the, the focus was that I was looking at and how I took that forward into looking at teaching. So the conceptions of learning and teaching literature are mostly underpinned by work that's both phenomenographic, relational, and also non-dualist. Uh, and that's why you have to do the hands thing when you explain what, what non-dualist is, because it's the relationship between the phenomenon and the way it's experienced. Um, and by the, by the time I was doing my PhD, Martin de Lauber and Beatty, and that's Liz Beatty, who also has a connection with the programme, um, had found a sixth conception of learning, which was learning is changing as a person. That also relates to some of the things that Ray was saying this morning, um, that I had this kind of fundamental belief that if there was a sixth conception of learning, that learning was um, about changing as a person, then surely there should be a, re a relational conception of teaching, which, which is that some teachers should see teaching as about helping learners to change as a person. And in that literature, the range of conceptions moves from that kind of knowledge or information transmission approach right the way through to facilitation of learning or helping students achieve conceptual change. Um, and that all of these things describe relations, not things in themselves, but they describe the relationship between things and the way they're experienced. And the other thing that really got me going, now this isn't, for, this isn't from the PhD itself, uh, nor is it from any Lancaster literature. This is from an Australian academic called Cal Swan. And he wrote this, uh, this piece of work about sitting by Nelly. And it was something that got me troubled when I was first starting to read um, around the area of practice-based learning. It says 2002, but it was actually republished in 2002. Originally, it was published in the 90s. Um, and, and his view was uh, that a lot of people thought that all practice-based teaching must be student-focused. And his view was that maybe not all not all practice-based teaching was student-focused, and that sometimes that people could adopt this approach, which was purely sitting by Nelly, and it was just literally as information transmission-focused as the kind of lecture, that actually it wasn't all about, you know, lovely ex explorative experiential learning, that in some experiential learning approaches could be just as transmissive as lecture-based. So putting that together with some of the other ideas around um, social constructivism and practice, the, the, the key things which I was then taking forward are all the, the literatures around Wenger, Leif and Wenger. I, I'll tell you, one of the most fantastic experiences of my career was actually not just, not just beginning to read Etienne Wenger and thinking what an absolute uh, star he is, um, but later in um, our work around using the concept of create, uh, creative learning to practice and also communities of practice, um, Alison Shreve invited him to a, a dinner in London. Um, and I got to sit next to Etienne Wenger at dinner, so I got to touch the hem. <laughs> you didn't touch him too much. No, I didn't touch him too much. No, I didn't know where he'd been. So, but no, very nice man, very nice man. 
Um, and that's, I think, another part of it. It's a demystification, something that I learned, uh, again, very early on. I went to give, um, I went to give a paper at um, early in... It was actually a workshop um, poster thing uh, early, the European Association of Research into Learning and Instruction. Nice, snappy title. Um, and it was in Gothenburg. And I'd read all these people like Ferenc Marton and Roger Salio and people like that. And you, I don't know if you're, you're the same, but I don't actually think that we're, they were kind of real people. Um, and my first day there, I came across Ferenc Marton and I nearly fainted. It was just like, <laughs> Ferenc Marton actually exists. Uh, and uh, I got... You need a, to get out more, don't I you? know, I know. <laughs> <laughs> I, did, you know, do you construct do you construct an identity for these kind of people? And it, like, it's just like an ordinary guy, really. And I think learning that and learning that Etienne Vengo, what, what he liked for dinner and all those kind of things, put, made me realise that actually my own ability to relate not just to these theories or these approaches or the research ideas, uh, that actually I was part of that community of practice as well, that I wasn't on the outside looking in, I was actually on the inside looking in. And that's the important part of this programme, is that, yeah, you know, we, we all have that, that need to inquire around these kind of things. And yes, some of these people are still working and researching and giving papers in the same way as you are. Um, and just don't faint when you meet them. You know, like, oh my God, it's very smart. Um, but these were the really pervasive ideas for me, and I became, I became very, very keen on using these in future work after I finished uh, the PhD. And the, the biggest thing to come out of it was immediately after the PhD, I went rushing back. I'd got appointed to uh, a new university after, literally the week after I did my Viva, I'd been appointed to a dean's position at the University of Arts London, and there was a bidding process for the, the settles for, for the Centres of Excellence in Teaching and Learning. And they said, would you like to write a bid for it? And I said, well, maybe not on my own, but I know somebody who might like to do it with me, and this was Alison Shreve. So I said, I've just been doing this fantastic work at Lancaster. It's all about communities of practice. Tell you what, we could write this bid and we could put all that stuff in there, and it would be really good. And if we get the money, that would be even better, because we could do what, what you know, we could do all these fantastic things. Um, and this is just a summary of some of the things that we said. It was, it was probably one of the most enjoyable bits of bid writing that, that I'd ever done, apart from the fact that it was collaborative. Um, I don't know if we actually thought we were going to get the money. I'm not entirely sure. Um, but we kept on saying it was a bit like sort of dreaming like if we had this money god we could create PhDs in creative learning and practice let's do that let's put those in there so we had these fantastic um, objectives to disseminate um, various different ideas about practice-based teaching and learning embedding the scholarship of learning and teaching reward teacher practitioners Exploit exchange of experiences, you know, storytelling approaches, integrate the student voice, promote an environment to innovate and take risks. And they actually funded us. So, I mean, absolutely fantastic. Five years worth of funding, 4.85 million over five years. Um, and all of that, and this just being fired up by what had happened within the PhD. Um, and then actually getting that, that money to do those things within the institution <clears throat> really did, I would say, have an enormous impact um, on a wide range of people and, and did actually uh, work towards embedding some change within that organisation. Um, I'm still coming back to some of the things that have come out of that, and the institution still use some of the approaches, both for reward and recognition, and also for particularly things like um, encouraging pedagogic research um, and uh, ways of integrating um, new people into the community of teaching uh, in creative practices as well. So it, it's, it's not wrong to dare to dream about these things, nor to think about the, whether the bid is for 5,500 or 5 million. Um, actually to think, you know, what is it we really want to do and how can we do that? 
I just a little note there, the external evaluation was by Lancaster. <laughs> so the other thing that's pervasive in my experience since then is that Lancaster keeps coming back into my life in various other professional <laughs> ways. It kind of just like keeps popping up. So I thought I'd go back to some of these ideas. That One of the things that really stuck with me as well was this idea about storytelling. And I use it quite a lot in my practice now. Uh, and it may or may not be one of the things that stuck with you or is sticking with you. But there's a particular thing, and I'm pretty sure it was Murray, that talked about stories enhancing the informal learning process uh, and how we use them in order to... Um, and in fact, we were just doing that in one, in one of the workshops this afternoon, using a way of collaborating and talking about things to actually enrich the informal learning process. Um, and the piece that stuck with me was the, the work about Orr and his work on um, uh, photocopy engineers, um, about how photocopy engineers that basically don't have a scooby about what they're doing with the photocopiers when they try and fix them. Um, and what they do, where well, they've got a manual, and the manual doesn't actually tell you what to do, and I'm sure you've come across that before yourselves. And the manual tells you one thing, but actually you find out just by pressing lots of buttons that something else happens. Then you can't repeat it, because <laughs> you don't know what you did in the first place. But it's this idea about cooperative knowledge building, non-canonical practice, and I found that a very, very powerful concept, the idea that... We need to do that in order to build uh, knowledge about things where there isn't the canonical knowledge. Uh, and in a lot of practice-based settings, there isn't a manual and there isn't um, a way of doing something. People find things out by experiment, by experience, and by repeating, and by continued practice. And therefore, they need to exchange those stories. And so that's the same in teaching as it is in teaching a creative practice. So I've built into a lot of my work, and that's not necessarily research work, but research-informed educational development. I've built in a lot of opportunities for people to tell those stories and to have those stories recorded and to, to share them and to value uh, the information that comes from that. And also, obviously, the clip settle encourage that uh, storytelling and writing about practice. There's a... Um, there's a project which is still going. I, one of, um, uh, one of, a member of staff who uh, is at the University of Arts London now uh, said, oh, I, I, I've heard about you. I, I came across this person. They said, I've heard about you. I'm doing a MAD project at the moment, and can you tell me a bit more about it? And these MAD projects were called Ma Making a Difference, and it was all about uh, getting people to tell a story about what made a difference in the context of their course. Um, so it's very interesting to see, you know, four years on, that, that the projects are still sustaining and people are still making a difference through telling those stories. And that's... Oh, let me go back to that because you can't read it in blue. The, the or quote, which is the, the key part of the discussion is that they don't know where they're going. So they have to tell the stories. I find that happens more or less every day in my life, actually. You know? <laughs> How the hell do you do this? So what I took back into... This, this is me probably around about, um, about three, four years ago at Chelsea... Uh, when I moved to Chelsea College of Art and Design as a, as a dean within a kind of federal structured university, um, one of the things that I found was that um, although there were developments and there will be in a lot of complex universities developments of um, programme and structure and things like that, there was very little opportunity for people to get together and to use the knowledge that they had, that, that kind of uh, transactional knowledge a lot of the time. Um, and to use that in ways of uh, exploring how they might develop uh, programs, how they might develop uh, ways of working together. Um, and one of the things that happened in the context there was that we were looking at, um, or not looking at, we were merging three colleges within the federal structure. <clears throat> um, and so in order to make sense of that, we did some co-creation work 
around uh, the postgraduate landscape, around making uh, what we eventually called a graduate school. And so I thought we would use some of those approaches, but also merge that with the idea of co-creation, which is a, a, it's also a kind of design uh, research approach, which is using a particular co-creative technology. I'll just give you a diagram for what co-creation looks like. It, the Design Council call this the double diamond, but as, a, as an approach, it works well with other kind of situated approaches. The idea is that there are four stages, and that the, the first stage, you look for lots and lots and lots of ideas, and then the idea is you have two closing-in approaches. So you, you start with inf information <coughs> gathering, and then you narrow down the ideas. There's a lot of refining of ideas as you go through. You define what, you define what the needs are, and then you go out again and you look at different ways that you might meet the needs, you explore more ideas, and then you come back again and then you look at what the implementation plan might actually be. So in working on methods which were both situated within the design context and methods that I'd used in the PhD, I was using, a, I've kind of made my own hybrid really of design approaches with other research approaches that means that people can work with me or I can work with others in order to explore things that we can do differently. So uh, a project that, that we're working on at the moment is, is a project called the Learner Journey Project um, and in various different stages. Um, and I won't show you the video of this, this is just some sort of little vignettes from, from videos. We used a video approach uh, confidential within the institution, which is why I won't show it to you, um, where we videoed and asked students uh, questions, so a qualitative approach to asking the questions about what was their experience of the learner journey at the Glasgow School of Art. Um, and um, these students were very, very frank about different stages of the learner journey with us, and it helped us to understand. So it was kind of part of the opening out process, was finding out what was the, not just the variation of their experiences, not from the point of view, I didn't necessarily want to publish a paper out of this, but I wanted to be able to see what was the range of, of experiences and how might they differ in ways, um, what, what kind of things were we looking, what, what were the issues, what were the problems, and what kind of things were we looking to do. Um, and in this next phase, we did a number of different workshops using um, various different people, using students as partners in the research, as well as other staff and so on, and externals, um, until we got to our ways of looking at different solutions. So using a kind of research-based approach for working out um, things that could make changes within the curriculum. Then the next phase is this synthesis. So by then we've got about 10 different thematic clusters. So a sort of classic thematic analysis, as you would see in any kind of uh, research project. Uh, but then you go back out and cluster it down. One of the, you won't be able to see the detail here, but a lot of the approach that I've used with staff and with students in my own institution uses approaches of storytelling that they're familiar with. So I don't, just, I don't ask them to write stories. I ask them to draw me stories about their experience of things or to talk on video or whatever. So quite a lot of um, sort of cartoon storytelling and stuff like that that people really quite enjoy doing. Um, and they make us laugh out loud as well, which is always a good thing. And then by the final phase, you have an idea development stage, which means that you end up with various different storyboards and various different things that... that that you can take through. By the end of that process, which was last year, we ended up with five big projects that we've been taking through. We've been sponsoring five projects to go through uh, the school over uh, a couple of years. Oh, that looks foreign. And it's not foreign. It's obviously what's happened when it's gone onto your machine. <laughs> take it from me, we did a synthesis of outputs and it wasn't foreign. <laughs> it does, doesn't it? Look at that. Wow. It's quite nice colours. Anyway. Yeah. 
this is, <laughs> this is just sort of blatant advertising. This is Glasgow School of Art as it looks today. Uh, the, the, the old building on the left, which is still standing, contrary to popular belief, and there's a, there's a brand new building, oops, uh, on the right-hand side. Um, and so part of what's been taxing me at the moment, and some of the, again, some of these pervasive ideas come back into this, is, you know, how do, how do the concepts of what we do in particular spaces, like the old uh, studio spaces, which are still sort of beautiful and lovely, just not usable at the moment, how does that relate to what we do in any new building or any new space? And how do, you know, how do you negotiate um, what might be, you know, growing cohort sizes and so on? And is space and place important in, in pedagogy? Um, and how does that manifest? And is there, a, you know, again, is there variation in that? Are there some things which might be suitable in some cases and, and not in others? Is there, see, I'm, I'm one of these people, I don't think there's a gold standard in anything, but, you know, that there might be things that, context that are right. So the kind of future re research questions that I'm thinking about at the moment are about studio space and community of practice dimensions, uh, physical spaces influencing teaching and learning regimes, and whether or not there's uh, a, a piece of work to be done about work-based studios, about all that kind of work-based learning approaches. Is there, some, you know, is there something that to be done with the sort of collaborative learning spaces that we create with external agencies? And... Is the studio a real thing? People talk about the studio as being a gold standard in my context. Is it, is it a real thing? Is it, you know, can we reify the studio? That's another thing I learned on this programme, to say reify and not flinch. <laughs> um, all these ideas about virtual spaces and virtual learning, is a, is a virtual space as, as valuable, as valid, um, and in what context, if you're talking about practice-based learning? You know, people talk about things maybe not being um, as valuable. And also, how do students learn from those that aren't teachers, those that are technical staff, or those that are adjuncts to the teaching process? So I've still got lots and lots of things on my mind. One of the other things I've really got on my mind a lot is about, um, oh, look, the words have come off the end on that one. Leading with difference, that says, the particular case of learning and teaching leadership in the creative arts. Uh, strengthening learning and teaching leadership in the creative arts is a special edition of a journal called Text in Australia. And, um, and I believe that our research efforts do have to relate, and that, that the leadership literature is all as relevant to uh, what we're doing in learning and teaching as it is in some other areas as well. And that there needs to be a scholarly underpinning, that you don't, you know, don't suddenly lose your scholarship once you start talking about leadership. There needs to be scholarly underpinning for that as well. And um, I'll begin just to tell you a little bit about the, the, my, my final story, so to speak, is about the, the project that I'm working on at the moment, which is also using the same approach. I'm still using double diamonds with qualitative approaches. Uh, so the, the, the last one, the Learner Journey Project, we're halfway through that project at the moment, um, and we gave papers about it. At the, the, in Scotland, there's a, a Scottish Higher Education Enhancement Committee uh, which is sort of uh, sexily named Sheik. Um, and the Sheik committee, ha about half of its members are PhD graduates uh, of, uh, of this particular university, aren't they? I mean, it's just... A lot of them are. A lot of them are. Third. About a third? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So sometimes Murray manages to get something through when we're all there. Uh, <laughs> because Murray's doing a fair bit of work um, with Sheik on various different um, uh, projects around, uh, I can't remember, one of them's themes. about theme, one of them's themes and the other indicators. one is indicators. Oh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, the learner journey stuff, uh, we've, we've presented uh, quite a bit of that at Sheik 
uh, conferences, enhancement themes conferences. And what's brilliant about those conferences is they also include the student voice very, very strongly in Scotland. Um, and so students very much are partners in that process. And we did have students presenting with us when we presented the Learner Journey project because they were very much part of, of the whole process of making that and particularly of the storytelling. The current project we we're calling Platform Projects. I have no idea how we got to calling it Platform Projects, but it's because it's in stages. So this is Platform 1, and then we've got Platform 2 and Platform 3. Slightly corny, but, you know, it's just a handle. And these platform projects, we're looking at, at ways that um, staff and programme teams design and construct their programmes. Um, because we believe there's quite a lot of tacit knowledge um, in the way that they do those kind of things. And that although there might be things which are the espoused theories, the espoused knowledge within the programme documentation, that actually there's a huge difference between the programme documentation and what's going on actually in the programme. So we've asked them, using this process we've designed, we've asked them to tell visual stories and uh, make sense of their programmes by actually designing it in a... In a we've, we've given them a framework and we've asked them to use um, post-it notes to actually create um, a, like a layered story of what their programme looks like. And we're going to we're going to start digitising these very shortly. So this is this is extremely interesting. Um, I've never tried anything quite like this before. And most people seem to think that you know most universities, most higher education institutions have an approach to curriculum design uh, and planning. Uh, and obviously that is there is an espoused relationship between that and what's in the program handbook. Um, but there's a, there's a thing. We started talking about what uh, the magic. Is there something that happens? Is there the magic that happens in between? Something happens between the programme handbook and what people then actually do. And what is it that, that happens? What, what's the translation process? So we've asked people to try and visualise for us what those things are. Um, and this is not... An, I know I was really laughing when um, Ray showed us the really happy students. And I was thinking, oh, my God, I've got a picture of happy staff later on. And this is, this is not a fudge. I've not asked these people to look happy <laughs> while, while they were doing it. Um, they must have just been high by the time it got that far into the afternoon. Um, but they really enjoyed doing it. And um, they, it was much more fun than I thought it was going to be. <laughs> <laughs> so these are actual quotes from the evaluation so far. And um, we've been designing and redesigning the tool in a way to capture what that practice is. And we're going to use this as a way of um, analysing what people are doing with their practice on programmes so that we can understand certain things. Like, you know, people talk about things being embedded in their programme. Well, where the hell are they embedded? That's what I want to know. Um, and also, for a lot of people, it's really, it's really helped people understand quite how complicated some things are. It has, you know, it's really complex. Does it have to be that way? Um, and the obvious thing, you know, uh, we thought this was going to be a waste of time, but actually when we got there, it wasn't quite so bad. Um, I think maybe it was because we did, again, you know, it was very much a collaborative activity. People really enjoyed being part of making something um, that related to, to the reality of their world. So I'm going to end on this note, which is about, is this learning that lasts? And that's an un unapologetic quote from Marcia Mankowski. Um, are there particular aspects for you that have had, uh, even so far, if you're on the programme now, an impact on policy and practice in your field? Are there things which you feel you could probably sit in the middle stair on and go, I understand that, and I could explain it to somebody else? Um, and how have you embraced that shifting identity? Um, there may be many, many things in your shifting identity that, you, that you've had to encounter, or great things that you've had to take on board, like changes of title or job or responsibility. Um, but just a moment to reflect on what some of those things are. I, I'm a, appreciative of the fact also that, that apart from questions um, and the VC coming in at some point. I'm probably the last person that stands between you and a warm glass of Sauvignon Blanc. 
So I'll leave it at that and you can ask me whatever you like. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Linda, for that really compelling rendition of the way in which you've related research and practice through your career since the programme. I thought mm. it was brilliant, so thank you. So um, we've probably got about eight minutes for questions or comments. Who would like to kick us off? Alison. Alison. Yeah, I'm really interested in how you managed to engage your staff in the kind of collaborative process. How, how do you actually find it's actually it's a bit like how do you create time to do your own research particularly because this is um, this is something that we're doing within the institution it's a very similar kind of thing you know block booking and saying it's going to happen you know um, in actual fact we thought we were going to derail this ourselves because of the fire and we were going to have a whole range of these workshops immediate, the week immediately after. Because the fire happened the week uh, before um, graduation, the week before the degree show, that was then our next moment that we were going to have space. After the degree show, there'll be space. There's always, you know, like after tea, there will be jam, you know. Um, uh, we said, yeah, there's going to be space, we'll put those in. So I just said, look, one absolute thing we're going to have to do is we're just going to move them lock stock to the beginning of term, you know, and, um, and just book them in and just say, look, we feel these are really important and just get, you know, senior buy-in. Um, very, very key to this was having uh, my boss, the director, very, very keen on using this as a way of exploring practice. Um, and also, we, you know, we're going to write papers out of this as well. You know, I'm not going to waste the opportunity. <laughs> Goodness, no. Yeah. Questions or comments? Mm. Nicola. Hi, Nicola. You said that uh, right at the beginning, the kind of program approach was one that you had been really insistent that, that, that it was important for you to pursue your actual thesis. Yeah. Have you uh, retained some elements of that conceptual approach, Jenny? I don't mean in necessarily your research, but in your general approach to your day to day job? Um, I think so, yes. I mean, it certainly still underpins um, if I have an ideology or, or an ontology, it's based on that, you know. Um, I'm, uh, it's not kind of a pick and choose thing. And it was because I'd read a lot, I'd read quite a lot of the literature before I decided it was that kind of approach that I wanted to adopt, but that I wanted to blend that with um, uh, ideas about communities of practice. Um, and I do have, I think what's probably sticking and, and is sticking more is that I've then had some PhD students have come to me because they've said, I've seen your writing on this and I like that approach. Um, and so I've got, uh, I don't have thousands of PhD students, don't get me wrong, I've got one PhD student at the moment who wants to do um, a phenomenographic approach on widening participation to art education, like variations uh, of... Um, of student experience about widening participation. Um, and there is one other in the institution at the moment, but I've just said I can't take on two PhD students that both want to do phenomenography at the same time and be deputy director of an institution. It would just be too much. But, uh, yeah, and I do see that as something that kind of... It's like a river that runs through it. It's something that really underpins the way I think. Yeah. I was just uh, interested in... Synergies that you see between a design approach and a research research yeah. approach. Say a little bit more about that. Yeah. Well, um, apart from anything, it's it's something because it's situated within my context. Um, it's something that people value, so that's really really useful. Um, it is also as an approach, an approach is being used in other uh, subject contexts as well. It's being used quite a lot in business studies and business contexts as well. Um, in those contexts, it's often called service design, where you're using um, a way, the double diamond approach is used in that. But it's, it's really just to be sort of faithful to the context, really. Um, and I've, in working with other people that have used these design research approaches, 
I think I've had a kind of more a more authentic um, integration with some others. When I first came back from Lancaster, not that I was kind of immersed in it for five years, but I, you know, when I was sort of like the new convert coming back and going, oh my God, look at this, this is amazing. I was saying things to people in my art school context and they were going, uh? <laughs> and really looking at me like I was com A, a geek, and B, you know, completely bonkers to even talk about some of these things. Um, so using that kind of hybrid approach has really helped. You know. And people don't think I'm quite as bonkers now, you know. But <laughs> quite a good thing. Okay, have we got time mm. for one more question or comment? Mm. Mm. That always creates silence. It does, it? yeah, <laughs> when you say that. <laughs> oh, okay then, well, let's right. thank Linda. Thank you. Um, so I now would like to ask the Vice Chancellor of Lancaster University, Professor Mark Smith, to come and say a few words. Well, first of all, you know, you get to play two slots. You either start or you close things. So I'm going to have to use the closing and say I hope you've had a very successful. I'm sure you've had a very successful day. And I'll just make a few closing remarks. And I, I from the previous speaker, I got the hint already that. Uh, it's a dangerous position to be speaking in, given that it's between you and the um, Sauvignon Blanc. So I will try and not uh, be too long. In fact, the other day, um, and for the great thing about giving a talk like this is that and such, you may have even done some research on this, because as you know, one of the ways you get evaluation of teachers and the way presenters have uh, presented is you, you get feedback forms. But I'm glad that there aren't any feedback forms here, because there were, I was at a meeting... Uh, a few months ago where I gave a talk and there was some feedback forms afterwards and of course you eagerly then look at the, um, the comments don't you at the end you, got, you get the tick boxes but you then always see what the free the free text says and I got to the end and it said um, it said something along the lines of um, if I had one hour left to live on this world I may well do it listening to Mark Smith and I thought oh this is a splendid sort of thing there's a little, there's, there was a little asterisk PTO because he made the last hour seem like eternity. <laughs> but, uh, uh, but, but, uh, but, but nevertheless, I, I'm hopefully not going to make the, first, the next five minutes uh, seem like eternity. And what I want to do is say it's absolutely fantastic to see um, you know, alumni from this course that's now celebrating its uh, 20 years. And I'm glad to see that no opportunity is spared at having a celebration. Um, and, of course, it's very, it's very timely, given that uh, we as a university are celebrating our 50th uh, as well. And, in fact, this weekend is the birthday weekend. We've managed, we've managed to stretch the parties out almost over a year. But if you have to identify the date, it's this weekend, because the Royal Charter was signed creating the University of Lancaster on the 14th uh, of September 1964. And of course, without the signing of that Royal Charter, none of it, none of this, including this particular course we're celebrating, would be here. So uh, I'm glad we've been able to wrap the two things up together. And one of the great joys of having a role like Vice Chancellor is you get, it's the opposite of, I understand it's the completely opposite of being an academic, because being an academic, you get to know more and more about less and less as you become the expert in something. As a vice chancellor, you begin to know less and less about more and more. But what it means is you actually get to dip in to see some of the great things that your other colleagues are doing. And in particular, um, uh, the, the kind of briefing I was provided for what this uh, 20 years was about illustrated again some of the ways that Lancaster has been in the forefront of thinking around a particular area. And the idea of creating a PhD in educational research that people did alongside their normal day job. In fact, I hugely um, admire those people that managed to find the time to do that because if I think back to my PhD, I couldn't have think, thought of doing anything alongside it because it was so all-consuming, but that perhaps that says something about scientists, basically. But nevertheless, the point that you, you have a course whereby you create a community that allows you to reflect on practice and base larger your research on things that you're already doing in the workplace and understand them a bit more, 
I think it was a fantastic innovation, and I know some of the people who are behind that thinking are in the room today, so congratulations on that. And of course, it's a very important area in its own right, in the sense that, of course, trying to understand why and how things in higher education work requires research. And that's the sort of uh, thinking that the group of people here have been doing. So collecting together uh, students of the past, our alumni, students of today, and of course the staff who teach it, I think was a great idea and way of celebrating the 20th. And it allows me uh, to kind of encourage all of those people, particularly the students of yesterday and today, to stay in touch not only with each other, and that's one of the things I've learned through the 50th um, celebrations, is first of all how important an alumni community is, not only to the institutions but to each other. I'm sure you realise that, but nevertheless, you know, the effort in keeping in touch I think is very important. There's clearly some very important research come out of the PhDs that have been done as part of this course. Um, I'm sure that people didn't realise it at the time, particularly those of you who took a PhD earlier in the project, but the fact that it has uh, influenced the way things are thought about, policy, practice, that would nowadays, of course, be called impact. And you were having impact long before it was actually given that title, which in some quarters has become slightly pejorative, but uh, of course it isn't. It's a very important thing. So um, I hope you've, I'm sure you have enjoyed the day, and uh, I'm very pleased to have been able to come and say uh, a few things. And of course, the, the thing we're doing with our 50th is looking forward to the next 50 years of the university, and I'm sure one of the things that's coming out of today is looking forward to the next 20 years of this uh, particular program. But uh, congratulations on, on the birthday. Say how important it is to the university that things like this are taking place. And it, I, I really didn't know how many, well, one thing you didn't say in your briefing to me was how many people you're expecting. And I, I didn't know, but or I didn't have any feel, I should say. But I'm actually very impressed by the kind of size of the cohort, and I'm sure the quality of the cohort as well, um, that have, uh, have, have come along uh, today. And I think it says everything about the way this experience of a PhD in this, this area has been regarded, that you've got such a great turnout. And so I look forward to kind of mingling with a few of you in the next uh, 15 minutes or so, as hopefully that long presaged glass of wine uh, actually comes into being. So thank you very much, and uh, it's been a pleasure to come over and say a few words. Thanks a lot. Thanks. Thank you. That, that, yeah, that, that was great. Thank you. Um, so we're nearly there, um, but, but we just need to finish with a few, few thank yous. This morning, um, when I was introducing the day, we focused quite rightly on the achievements of the students on, on the programme. What I'd like to do now is just to thank some of the staff who are here who've been involved. Um, so Catherine Doherty, who's done a lot of the organising for today, but also people who were there at the start of the programme. So Peter Goodyear, who originally got the programme through the accreditation process, had hoped to be here but was unable to. Um, but it's really nice that Oliver, Oliver Fulton is here, who was there originally at the programme, and um, Rosemary Dean, who um, Murray reliably informs me it was originally her idea that we do the programme and asked Murray to do the first brief on what the programme would look like. Um, it's also really nice that Mance York's here, who at various times has been an external examiner for the programme and then latterly has taught on the programme, so, so it's lovely that you're, you're here too. Um, and then just to mention some of the current staff. So Paul Trowler would really like to be here, but he's in France, but he sends his best wishes. <laughs> it's, uh, you know, hey-ho. I've got a picture of him on the beach, by the way. <laughs> Available for five pounds a pop, so, you know. Um, it's lovely that Murray's here, because for me, Paul and Murray both embody the academic values of the programme, and they're really important to the way in which the programme's developed. It's brilliant that Malcolm's contributed to, to, to today, he's led the programme for 10 years and I think he's led it with great integrity and his commitment to higher education research has really come shining through. Um, but there's one person who is acknowledged in more of the PhD thesis than anyone else. She probably holds a world record for the number of times she's been um, thanked in PhD acknowledgements in thesis. She's central to the inclusive community of the programme and she's worked, Alison has worked on it since it started 20 years ago. So we have... Um, oops.
Okay, and now you can have your glass of wine. <laughs>